All right. Well, hello everybody. Welcome. It's a it's you know a great pleasure to introduce my good friend Alvaro Sanchez, who's today's colloquium speaker. Uh, Al's just like a very eclectic and versatile researcher. He did his you know it's like everything he's done. It's fantastic and it's all all over the place. It's it's super fun. So he did his PhD at Brandeis University with Yannick Condon and Jeff Gellis. And when do, in, in doing so, on the one hand, he did amazing single molecule in vitro uh, experiments on transcriptional regulation. And at the same time, he spearheaded the, the theoretical study of uh, noise in transcriptional regulation. And that led him to basically become one of the, I would say, one of the go-to person people in the field. And, but somehow, you know, that wasn't enough. He could have gone down that path and he had some amazing papers on this. Uh, but then he decided he wanted to try something different and, and went to work with Jeff Gore, who's uh, one of our own Jeff Gore, like he got it from physics or biophysics, I can't remember, uh, uh, at MIT, where he started learning about how microbial populations uh, work together to survive and how you can tell when a population is going gonna, is gonna to disappear and with a, with a strong angle on evolution. And that led to, I would say, the, 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 you know, the, Al's own evolution when he transitioned from this postdoc uh, in Jeff's lab at MIT to a position, an independent position at the Roland Institute at Harvard, and later on as a, an assistant professor at Yale University, um, where he, he's been basically trying to understand how populations of bacteria or microbes work and evolve together. And one of the things, I don't, I don't think he's necessarily gonna talk about this today, but one of the things that always caught my imagination was this concept that he talked to me about the idea of domesticating communities of microbes to do things that you want to you want them to do. So so it you know it's it, as you will see he's he does fantastic exper quantitative experiments that talk to to theory. He owns both the theory and the experiment. It's one of the, the the very best examples I would say of this dialogue between theory and experiment that many of us are trying to advocate in the study of living matter from the standpoint of physics. He's also been recognized by lots of awards, just like such like uh, being a Packard Fellow. He has an HFSB Young Investigator Award and, and all sorts of all sorts of fancy accolades. Um, so again, it's a great pleasure to have him here. I think it's it's very exciting to to have uh, someone like him speaking to the whole physics community. Um, he's requested, and and I'm sure he'll reiterate that that he be interrupted along the way. So if you want to interrupt, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask questions, or you can write things in the chat, and I'll let. I'll know, or you can also raise your hand. So in the questions period, we might do hand raising just so that we, we can have a good order of people. Um, so with that, I'll take it away. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you, Hernan. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to live up to that, um, that very generous introduction. Um, and and I, I hope everybody's doing well in this, this really horrible year we've been through. Uh, I know it's been particularly hard in California. Uh, and I, 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 I was telling Hernan that I've been feeling lately like it's starting to weigh on me <laughs> and that uh, I, I'm not as, you know, I feel like thick lately, right? So uh, I, was pre I was putting a lot of thought into preparing this talk uh, because I know it, it's for an audience that is not of people that do ecology and evolution primarily. So I just wanted to, to make it as clear as possible. And I've had a hard time in, 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 in trying to kind of distill a talk that was clear and, and will give you all a, a good perspective of the kind of work we're doing. Um, and, uh, and so I'm hopefully I'll I accomplish that, but I was telling Hernan that please by any means interrupt me if whatever I'm saying is not, is not clear. Um, and I would be more than happy to stop and, and, and just clarify whatever, whatever it is. So I'm gonna go and, and share my screen now. Um, okay, so it's not showing. Okay, give me a minute. Um, I'll minimize this one. All right, so as Hernan uh, pointed out, so the, what my lab does is we're very interested in trying to understand in a quantitative way how microbial communities form and how they evolve. And uh, one of the ultimate goals we have is to see if it is possible to, to, to use the tools of ecology and evolution to control these communities. And uh, one of the, the, I think, very excited directions that, uh, that exciting directions that we're working on now is uh, on the domestication from in whether 
we can do direct evolution um, uh, with, com with entire communities. Um, but today, what I'm going to be telling you is, is more on, on an, another set of questions we've been asking that well, I was trying to think very hard about uh, what it is that we can predict uh, about microbial community assembly. So uh, before I start, I, I wanted to tell you all why it is that we am, I'm so interested in microbial, in microbial communities and microbes in general. And I think that the, the clearest reasons is that microorganisms are everywhere. Uh, they are, of course, the uh, most ancient organisms on earth. They were here way before animals and plants made it. And uh, they are essentially everywhere, right? They have colonized every corner of the planet. You find them in every single, uh, in all of the bodies of water, both large and small from the oceans and the rivers to lakes and ponds. You find them in very large numbers in the soils. Uh, you find them living uh, on the bodies of all animals and plants, including our own body. And they're present in the cities that we build and in the foods we make and absolutely everywhere else. And in all of these habitats, microbes play really important and critical roles despite the very small size. Microorganisms are responsible for the vast majority of nitrogen fixation in, in the planet. Uh, I think the number, I'm gonna quote from memory, but soil bacteria alone are responsible for about 10% of all carbon cycling in the atmosphere. Maybe a bit less, but it's around 10%. And when you find them uh, in association with their hosts, microorganisms are directly responsible for uh, their health outcomes, both in terms of health and disease. Humans have, of course, domesticated microorganisms for millennia. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, the Egyptians already were using uh, yeasts uh, to make uh, wine, um, but have many other examples from other drink, fermented drinks like kombucha to uh, foods like cheese or bread, among many others. And more recently, we've been also using microorganisms for other bioengineering purposes, from uh, cleaning up water in wastewater treatment plants to producing biofuels in biorefineries. And traditionally, the way that we have studied microorganisms is by isolating them from the environment and growing them as colonies of a single species uh, on petri dishes or on flasks, and then uh, putting them under the microscope and study uh, small colonies uh, of isogenic populations. But in nature, microorganisms very rarely live like that. The most often microorganisms live forming very complex ecological communities uh, that are comprised of large number of species that interact with one another in really fascinating ways. And those interactions give rise to the, the properties. And it's that this is a point that is very worth making because all of this uh, uh, functions and services that microbes provide, both in nature and in biotechnology, are most often the outcome of a large collective of microorganisms living together and affecting the environment together. So for all of these reasons, understanding and controlling how micro communities form and how they evolve, it has become a, a real aspiration of modern biology and one that can uh, really help us transform many different fields of science. So uh, here's the, the way I, I think it, right? Like, like every field, uh, this one needs a theory, right? Um, and it's very hard, right? Because micro communities are really complex systems that are often very difficult to even, I mean, we, we cannot even see them, right? Like, uh, like many uh, macro ecosystems, micro, microbial ecosystems are, are formed by tiny organisms that are very difficult to see and observe in the natural environment, right? Um, so that adds on to the complexity of just uh, incorporating e ecological theory, on, which on its own is a, is a very difficult task. Um, but at the same time, it is clear that developing a theory for microbiome assembly, as well as models that can be used in a specific uh, circumstances, would be incredibly helpful. And when I was thinking about this whole business of, of well, we need a theory, but, but the first thing perhaps that came to mind is, okay, but how do we... Um, how do we define, like if we're trying to build a predictive model or of, of a microbial community, we need to identify like at what level, uh, what descriptive features of those communities uh, are going to be uh, reproducible and therefore predictable and which are not and are gonna be governed by stochasticity and, and chance. So 
the assembly of micro communities is, is actually governed by the um, confluence of both deterministic and stochastic processes. On the deterministic side, uh, we have selection. And um, although we often think of selection as an evolutionary force, it is also an ecological force, right? Uh, and, and this is very simple to understand why the, it is deterministic. In a given environment, there will be some taxa that grow very strongly on it, very robustly. They can give, uh, reproduce a lot and, and produce a lot of uh, descendants. And there's gonna be other taxa that are gonna be more rare uh, um, because they can't grow as well. And there's gonna be finally some taxa that cannot grow at all, right? And that is going to be determined by an interaction between the genomes of those microorganisms uh, and the environment uh, and, and whether they have the right genes to be able to metabolize the nutrients that are available uh, or to survive the presence of, of, uh, of toxins that might inhibit their growth and so on and so forth. But in addition to having deterministic forces shaping the like selection, shaping the assembly of microbial communities, the assembly of microbial communities is also inherently governed by stochasticity. So in order for selection to do its job, and, 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 and for some taxa to grow better in an environment than others, those taxa must be able to get into those habitats. Okay? And the way in which microorganisms get into a habitat is, uh, is driven by dispersal, which is an inherently stochastic force. Like, you know, if, if I now touch this, uh, my computer, there's some chance that the microorganisms that happen to be in the area that I touched will stick to my, my skin and may have a chance to potentially colonize it. If you eat a piece of fruit uh, instead of another, then the microorganisms that are living on the surface of that piece of fruit will colonize your, your digestive tract uh, as opposed to if you have chosen another one, right? So it is very clear that um, in, in the, 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 the mechanisms that, that put a microbe in a given habitat, uh, which range from you know, the, the wind blows and deposits the, the, the airborne microorganism on, on your plate, if you do the kind of experiment in the lab, to, you know, um, you know, as a mosquito arrives in a little pond of water and, and, and drops an egg, and then also deposits its part of its microbiome, right? So oh, dispersal is an inherently stochastic process, right? It's gonna be very difficult to predict. But on top of that, microbial populations are still made up by individuals, right? Uh, even if they're tiny, uh, cells uh, are reproduce and they can die uh, by, you know, by being hit by a virus or uh, being killed by another cell or, or just bursting out through uh, a, a lysogen coming out or for any number of reasons. So uh, the births and deaths of individuals are stochastic, they, of all individuals, right? Not only of bacteria, that uh, plays out for animals and plants as well. Uh, and even though populations are large, uh, drift can still play an important role right? because communities are diverse and some of the taxa are not uh, that abundant, right? So they can be still governed by drift. Uh, finally, you have mutations can be at play as well. So micro populations are very large. They have generally very large number of individuals and they also uh, have faster mutation rates. So it is uh, mutations of course occur randomly in the genome. So you could have even if you have two identical environments that start from the same uh, species, and people have done these experiments in the lab where they've been propagating a, a clonal population for, you know, 30 years, and of course by the end of even with no other um, force to at play, um, mutations are occurring randomly in those populations and leading to different genetic structure in those populations. So, in natural habitats, um, chance and selection are occurring at the same time. Uh, and it, that kind of makes it difficult to, to disentangle them and, and, uh, and, and really tease them apart to understand how reproducible community assembly is going to be uh, under any different set of circumstances. And this is made even harder because the, the full history of species dispersal into a habitat, right? Um, when exactly a species landed in, in one particular uh, biological um, habitat is, is something that we don't really have a good track of, and it's actually very, very hard to, to know, right, in most natural environments. And likewise, selection, the selective pressures that are present in a, in a natural habitat are generally not known, right? Now we can rationalize them, we can hypothesize them, but it's very difficult to, to precisely know or have a very good idea of what are the selective pressures um, in a given environment. It is possible to infer them, as I said, but, but it, it, it is generally um, a hard thing to do. So um, as a result, uh, understanding uh, the, the why two environments that appear to be identical 
uh, may have uh, different communities, as is very often the case, right? Uh, is very challenging, right? So again, if we want to understand the reproducibility, doing this in natural habitats is just a very difficult thing to do, right? Because the variation, I mean, you might have two different habitats that have different microbiomes, and, and therefore you might conclude that, um, that at least at the species level, there's a lot of variation. Uh, but in principle, that could be because those two plants that appear to be very similar are actually not that similar, or that there are sufficient differences between them that, uh, that may be nuanced, you might not know about, it, about them, but that uh, are enough right, to, to present different selective pressures and therefore recruit different taxa to each of those habitats. It is also possible that you know, without you knowing, uh, each of those two plants are actually subject to different uh, regional pool species pools. Uh, which is something that we cannot can have a general idea what tax are present in an environment, but which of those tax are actually landing on, on which of these, say, this example here, two different plants, would be actually difficult to determine, right? They're not trivial at least. But on top of that, uh, there are also intrinsic sources of, of variation, right? Uh, as we said before, random dispersal. Even if you had two exactly identical environments that are colonized from the same species pools, still there's going to be some uh, variation in community assembly that might be driven by the fact that dispersal into those habitats is in inevitably random, that mutations are occurring in each one of those two habitats, and that drift is something, is another force that is just uh, an impossibility to get rid of, right? Uh, even if you have uh, large population, there's still always going to be some level of population drift. So what would be ideal, right? If we wanted to, to get to the bottom of uh, at what level do we have reproducibility in community assembly, uh, would be to first start by uh, creating an idealized scenario where uh, all of these extrinsic sources of variation are removed, right? So if we're left with um, an, an, an ecological assembly of microbial communities where the only sources of, of variation that can lead to lack of reproducibility in the assembly process were the ones that are inevitable, uh, we could get a baseline understanding uh, of, of, of the phenomenon of reproducibility, right? So, um, what the approach that my lab is following um, has been to study the assembly of microbial communities um, in large number of replicates in, uh, in habitats that uh, where we have removed all of those sources of variation. For instance, uh, we can have a large number of replicate habitats where, which we colonized from the same large but identical regional species pool, right? By sampling from it and inoculating them into these into this habitats. And moreover, what we wanted to also do is to make those habitats identical to each other so that we're gonna also remove any possible, uh, the, the second extrinsic source of variation that, that there might be variations between them. We can make those habitats as similar as possible. And we can also make them in a synthetic way to be as uh, to contain the same nutrients and, and the same defined recipe and the amount the same amount of volume to, so basically to make them identical but in a way that we understand right we can we can make those habitats the same uh, to one another to, from one to another but also knowing what it is exactly that we are putting in so that we can rationalize what the selective pressures and and kind of minimize the possible the potential for uh, unknown uh, selective pressures playing out. Even, even then, they can all, that can also happen, right? Because it, it is actually uh, very difficult to have perfect control over, over that. So anyway, so this is what we, we set out to do. We, we thought, well, if we set out uh, an experimental system where we can repeat the same experiment many, many times um, under, con under conditions that we understand, right? And eliminating every source of extraneous variation, uh, we can ask then, Okay, if we do the same experiment many times, are we gonna get the same result? Right? If we do, right, or at whatever level of description that we do, uh, that will indicate a level of description that is potentially reproducible, right? Uh, at, or that should be reproducible in the absence of those extraneous sources of variation. Uh, and, and, if, and that's essentially what we're after. Okay, so, so this is the, 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 in a nutshell, the idea, uh, the core idea of, of everything I want to be telling you today. Um, and if there's any questions at this point, I'm more than happy to, to take them. Um, but, uh, but if not, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next. All right, so to, 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 to tell you how I, we are implementing this idea, um, it's actually super simple, right? So we need a very large um, and diverse species pool uh, of bacteria from which we can um, 
inoculate um, uh, by randomly sampling it into a habitat that contains defined synthetic media, which in all of the experiments I'm going to be telling you today about, uh, contains glucose as the only carbon source. Um, and, and carbon is the only on the single uh, growth limiting environment. Now to generate this very large species pool, which is going to be our inoculum, what we do is uh, we take natural samples, which contain very rich and diverse microbiomes. Uh, and that could be from soil samples to plant matter to, um, you know, we've done also with, with human stool samples, um, with aquatic communities. So we, we could take this basically an, a natural environment that contains a very rich and diverse uh, community. And we stick it into a, a bottle of water, um, just that. And in the, at this point, what we do is because we want to simplify our, our experiments as much as possible, is that we want to, we add at this point a, a drug that it inhibits the growth of fungi and other, uh, and other small eukaryotes, right? And, and that will make sure that the, the only microorganisms that we end up with are or primarily are uh, bacteria. And it's simply for the sake of convenience, right? All right, so at this point, we, we stick this, this sample into a, into a bottle, we add water. Now we, we filter the large soil particles to end up with just a, a very, very large and diverse um, pool of bacteria. And, and the soil in particular is very, very diverse. So one gets here thousands and thousands of different taxa uh, in, your, in your bottle. And now from here, we, we sample a small volume uh, that, that contains a, a representative sample of, uh, which is again, stochastic, uh, of whatever cells were here and inoculate them into our environments. We then, um, these environments again, they, they contain a minimal media which contains all of the nutrients that are required for microbial life. Uh, basically uh, phosphorus, we have phosphate, nitrogen, we have ammonium, uh, carbon, we have glucose, uh, as well as, as calcium and, 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 and sulfur and, and you know, a bunch of other ions. Now, um, it's, 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 it's important to remark that in, in these environments, glucose is the growth limiting factor, right? So if you titrate the amount of glucose, you will see that amount of growth will increase linearly with it, right? Whereas the other, um, the other nutrients are in excess, right? So um, the, you could keep, uh, you can add more or less, but that won't, help, that won't matter very much for the growth of any taxa in the habitats we're in. All right, so once we inoculate by randomly sampling uh, taxa from, from this bottle, we take about a million cells in here, uh, in the first time, then we let them grow, right, for 48 hours. We just let them be for 48 hours. We put them in an incubator at 30 degrees. Um, and after two days, we come back, and what we find is that this, this, this uh, small population, well, small, 10 to 6 uh, cells that we added in, has, has grown up significantly, right? Um, so then what we do is we, after 48 hours of growth, we sample, again, randomly from this, um, from this test tube, uh, on average, we take one out of every 125 cells uh, and we pass this them, we, we add them to another tube that contains the same defined synthetic media as we had added before, right? So this basically is a, it's a replicate of this habitat. So we basically start do the same thing process as we did here, but instead of inoculating from the bottle, we inoculate from the growth for the previous day. Now we let them grow again and we can repeat and repeat and repeat, right? So you can iterate this process of you grow, then you, you take a small sample and add it to a new test tube that is identical to the one you had before, you let them grow again, and you repeat and, and repeat. And the one thing I wanted to, to tell you is that at the end of every growth period, we use 16 as sequencing to, um, to characterize the, um, the community composition in, in our habitat at that time, right? So it's just, we sequence the DNA, and, and that gives us a quantitative estimation of the abundances of different microorganisms uh, on, our, on our test tubes. This is a, a typical outcome of our experiments. Um, what you see here, and it, 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 I'm assuming that many of you would not be familiar with this type of plots. Let me walk you through what, what this means. Uh, on the x-axis here, we're plotting every transfer we did. Uh, like basically it's the community state after 48, uh, 48 hours of growth, after uh, the first period of 48 hours, the second period, the third period, and so on. Uh, and now every column, um, Every, every one of these columns, which is colored in a different color, uh, represents a different species. And the width of the column represents the abundance of the species, right? So in, in here, this um, blue uh, bar represents the abundance of this Enterobacter species, which at, on, after the first transfer makes up about 70% of the community. This red bar represents a, one of the pseudomonas species that we have in our, in our community. Uh, and it, it makes up maybe, I don't know, eight, 
to 18% of the taxa and so on and so forth. This gray bar you see here is made up by all of the taxa, all of the species that are so rare that we cannot, we don't have enough colors, right? Um, so we just make this big uh, gray blob to represent all of the other taxa that are present at less than 1% abundance, right? So what you could see here is that the, the abundance of these species grows at first, then declines, and then it settles at around 20%. The same thing happens for the abundance of these other species, which is our, it's called Raultella, or that, this, this yellow one, which is Citrobacter, or this one, which is uh, Pseudomonas. And one, you think, one of the things you can tell is that after about nine to 12 transfers, uh, community composition at the end of every 48 hour incubation period uh, is more or less the same as it was the previous day, right? Uh, the previous 48 hours. So at this point, we tell the community is in equilibrium. And this really is an equilibrium as I will prove uh, later uh, in this talk. Hey, Alvaro. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, so yeah, the big gray bar at, um, yeah. at time zero. It's, yeah. Um, how do you sift out all of these unknown taxa between zero and one? Or how does it go from being so like 70%, 80% to 5%? Right. So um, some of them actually come up later, right? So the, this, this orange bar is not here, and it appears later. So it, it's one of these gray bars that now, uh, the gray only means that it's below 1%. Right? Oh, so, so, okay, I see, I see. Right, right, right. So it's like we're grouping together all of the taxa that are below 1%, right? So because the, otherwise you would see so many bars that it would be very kind of hard to, um, and we, and, you know, we don't have enough colors. Uh, it's just for convenience, that's the only reason. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, all right, so. Yeah, I hope this is clear and, and you will see plots like this later. So I, I hope you know, if anyone has any question about what it is I'm plotting also, it's a good time to ask, so. Um. Hi, do you mind if I ask questions? Sorry, just on the slide. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the uh, vial at transfer 12, that's yeah. then, I guess, 24 days later. Um, right. It has the composition you're showing. Mm -hmm. What does the composition of your original, say like the transfer zero, sample it's, like 24 days later oh you mean just just left it untouched in the fridge or, or i mean it, 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 this so this is just the bottle right um that we had at time zero right so you, you're saying because this is after subjecting it to transfers right so it, it 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 you grow it and then you dilute and you grow and you dilute right uh so your your question is if we had put this this sample in glucose and left it without transferring for 24 days? Yes, that's that's my question. Would that change? I do not know. We haven't done it. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I'm sure it would have, right? Um, so if, if you have, we have done experiments for 72 hours, for instance, but, um, and, and also for less, right? Uh, and I, I'm gonna show some dynamics within a given incubation period later, uh, but I, I would absolutely expect that many of the cells would start dying, right? Um, and I do not know which ones, but if you left it on glucose for 24 days, you're probably going to be doing a lot of selection for uh, survival to um, to the stationary phase, essentially, right? So once bacteria reach stationary phase, um, you're going to find that many of the cells will have died, right? Um, and others will have start growing in abundance. I would expect actually the diversity, if you were to repeat our experiments, for instance, with 24 hour incubation times, right? And you were to do this for whatever, a couple of years, um, that, or well, maybe not that long, right? But a few months. Um, I would expect that communities are gonna be a lot more diverse than we are seeing here. Here we are selecting basically for fast growth in glucose. And as I will show later, uh, fast growth on the organic acids that are released, uh, but death plays a very small role, right? So we, we barely see any death after even for, after every 48 hours. But if we had let this go for much longer, we would be still be seeing selection on the byproducts from the organic acids and then the tertiary and, for, ter and quaternary you know, byproduct production, as well as selection on not dying, right? Which is um, not a massive selective pressure here from the experiments we have done. I mean, that's what I would expect we will see, but it's, we haven't done it. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I had a small question. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a, a, a big discontinuity in the zoodomonas. Zoodomonas, yeah. <laughs> zoodomonas. Yeah. Uh, at, at day f at between, the, like, increasing it till, till day four and then 
suddenly cuts back on day five, it it seems. Uh, it seems like it's, it's I, I mean, did you have any explanation or interest in the discontinuity of rate of growth at this point? Is that just a stochastic variation or what? So I think it's population dynamics. So we, we have uh -huh. seen m multiple times, and actually it shows up in models too, um, that I didn't have, I didn't bring the slides, but we've I seen, see. it's in the paper. You, you see that um, it is predicted that uh, on the first few days that this, the intrabacteria will increase in abundance and then it, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll come back down and the pseudomonas will level off, right? So you, you see a period of expansion at, at around in, in the, the models, you know, it depends on what days the, and how you parameterize things. But, but the, this, this kind of shape is often seen in models as well. Um, this kind of overshoot of, of the intraacteresia, then a, um, a bit of a, um, a settling down towards the end. It, it's one, it, it, we, I think we have it in the paper. It's one of the supplementary figures in case you're mm -hmm. Um, would, there, would there be a theory of them dying of their own excrement, that kind of thing? Or? No, we, we don't have death um, because I, I don't think this is driven by death. It's, it's driven by mm -hmm. the, because whenever we do, tra we transfer cells, we also transfer oh, part right. of that environment, right? So, yeah, so right. we that's are, right. yeah. the, the environment is also rich equilibrating um, yeah. with, the, with the bacteria, right? And, uh, and, and I, I believe this is the ultimate reason, right? Is that um, both need to equilibrate at the same time and you have these two different dynamics, right? Um, the nutrients and, and the bacteria within, and that it takes the, typically the nutrients take a bit longer and eventually the, the bacteria cuts up, right? Um, so yeah. what, what you have is that in the end, uh, you have an overshoot in the, in the early days. Um, but yeah, no, the models don't have death per se. In, yeah, yeah, in I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No, you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, all right. So, so yeah, so this is just, I, I just wanted to show you this to, so you get an idea of, of what it is we're seeing, right? And for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be primarily talking about the, the state of communities on day 12, okay? Except later on, we'll, we'll, I will show you an experiment we did for a whole year, another experiment that we did for 18 transfers, but, but that's, um, it, it, at least for the next few slides, whenever you see a, a population uh, described in this bar format, think this is the state of the population after 12 days, okay? Of, or after 12 transfers for 24 days. So, so the first thing that is kind of a bit surprising uh, is that we, um, that we saw that um, five taxa coexisting on a media that contains glucose as the only carbon source, right? Um, the ecological theory tells us that, that there can't be more species than there are limiting resources and glucose is the only limiting resource we have, right? Uh, and this is very well established um, theoretical ecology. And the reason is that uh, even though we supply the bacteria with a single uh, growth limiting carbon source, which is glucose, as it grows, uh, as bacteria grow on glucose, uh, particularly the enterobacteria, as I will show in a, in a minute, um, they, and they, 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 up, they uptake the glucose to make biomass, but in the process, they release to the environment uh, secondary byproducts like as, lactate, acetate, succinate, pyruvate, which are the most abundant, but also uh, smaller amounts, but still sizable amounts of citrate, fumarate, valine, alanine, and a bunch of other amino acids, right? So even though the, every day when we transfer the, the cells, uh, we're adding them to an environment where glucose is the only supplied resource, the bacteria are rapidly turning that glucose into a, into a, you know, a, a, a large number of additional resources, right? So you go from one um, single um, growth limiting uh, uh, nutrient to having, you know, several dozens, right? Uh, at different abundances. So, so that explains why you have so many taxa coexisting. All right, so uh, that brings us back to the question I want to ask, which is how reproducible is microbial community assembly in, in these replicate habitats when, when we do not have any extrinsic sources of variation, or at least we've limited them to the maximum, right? So in, even in conditions, if we eliminate this ext extraneous variation, uh, how reproducible would it be if we did the same experiment that I just described here, if we repeat this eight times, for instance, right? So we did that experiment. We, we took uh, species from the same species pool and we inoculated eight identical replicate habitats and, and then we grew them um, and we passed them for 12 transfers, which is about 80 generations, um, as we said before. Okay? And then when we examine the composition of these communities, again, we're inoculated from the same pool species in identical habitats. Uh, we examine the, the communities that form after 12 transfers, what we find is that they're very different, right? In all those eight habitats. Um, so 
it doesn't seem very reproducible, right? Community assembly. And if it's not very reproducible, that puts into question whether we can possibly predict them. However, we also noticed that um, when, if instead of, of uh, grouping all of our DNA sequences, all of the cells we had by which species they, they belong to, we group all of our cells by which uh, taxonomic family they belong to. So um, the taxonomic family is a level of, um, of taxonomy that's higher up than species. Um, and it represents uh, a collective of many species that, are, that share a common ancestor, right? They are evolutionarily related to one another, right? Uh, and, and we share a relatively recent common ancestor, right? So uh, we thought, so what if we instead of, um, of, of Coarse grain, uh, what if we coarse grained our community composition instead of at the species level, at the family level, right? So we lose the detail about what species they belong to, but we just look at what families the different bacteria belong to. So when we do that and we examine the same data I showed you before, we find that community composition becomes a lot more predictable, right? Um, uh, all of these communities are now dominated by, are dominated by the same uh, family, which is in blue is the enterobacteria. Um, and in red, um, you have uh, and the second most dominant uh, species, most abundant species is Pseudomonas daisia, Pseudomonas. Uh, I know this, these names are a handful, but I, it's not my fault. That's how they're called. So blue is enterobacteria here and red is Pseudomonas, right? Um, enterobacteria is a family to which the famous bacterium E. coli belongs to. Uh, e. coli is an enterobacterium. Uh, and uh, Pseudomonas is, is also a, a common lab pet. I mean, many labs work with Pseudomonas. Um, and it's, they are, it's also a gamma proteobacteria. It's also, they are to both of these families are, are uh, fairly uh, close relatives to one another. All right, so we see that when we coarse grain taxonomic composition at the family level, um, it becomes a lot more predictable. And this holds still when we compare experiments that were done from very different regional species pools. So we, in this case, used 12 different species pools. And for each one of these, we did eight replicate populations that were inoculated from the same uh, original species pools. And after 12 days, we're here, we're plotting the family level composition. And you can see that they're all quite similar to one another, right? They're all dominated by this blue, uh, most of them, right? This, this one isn't, uh, but most of them are dominated by this blue um, family here, uh, again, enterobacteria. And the second most dominant one is this um, uh, pseudomonads in red. And the ratio between the two um, is quite constant. I mean, there's variations of course, but, but the, the average is around 0.3. Um, and it's, uh, it, as you will see, it's, it's kind of quite remarkable uh, how, how robust this number is. Um, okay, so we asked the question of how reproducible microbial community is when there's no extrinsic source of variation. And we find that it's rather variable in terms of species level composition, uh, but it's far more reproducible when we coarse grain taxonomic um, description at the family level. Okay, so that brings us to the question, why is that, right? Um, why is community assembly so much more variable at the species level, but so much, so much more reproducible at the, at the family level of taxonomy? So to, to answer this question, we need to understand what this family level convergence means. Eh? So, so what is it that we see this? And um, now I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cheat a bit. I'm gonna tell you something that we did, but I'm gonna tell you how, but I, I'm happy to, to let you know more at the end. Um, we, uh, in collaboration with Pankaj Mehta, we've been doing a lot of different simulations with essentially random matrices to, um, by sitting random ecosystems, we using consumer resource models. Um, we have suggested, right, that if uh, families, different taxonomic families shared similar quantitative traits, uh, similar preferences for different resources, uh, that you would actually observe results that are very similar to the ones that we found in our experiments, right? That family level convergence is observed despite um, species level composition. So all I want you to take from this slide is that there is a hypothesis, right? That the reason why we are seeing convergence, convergence at the family level is because there might be some shared quantitative traits at the family level uh, that explain uh, why you see the same family, the, uh, the same family in all communities uh, dominating and, and, and very similar ratios with the second most dominant family, despite the fact that they have different taxa, because those taxa belonging to the same family are actually quite similar quantitatively to one another, right? Um, so that's actually our hypothesis, right? And in particular, in, in, these, in these simulations that we run, our hypothesis is even a bit more refined. It would be that the dominant family, which is in this case, this green one, would be, would be the, the one that can consume the better, that is, that is the better consumer for the resource we supply. Whereas the second family here, the, the red one, 
is the one that consumes best the, uh, the, the most abundant uh, secondary metabolite that is produced by the former, right? So that's, um, that's what we find. And we wanted to test that hypothesis experimentally, right? Is it that um, the glucose is selecting for the entire bacteria or for members of that family, and as they're growing, they're secreting byproducts that are recruiting the, the, the second most abundant family, in this case, the pseudomonas. So to test this hypothesis, we isolated 100 different pseudomonas and entire bacteria from our glucose communities. Um, and, and the first thing we wanted to do is to measure the growth rates in glucose. Both of these families, all of our isolates, like 100% of them can grow on glucose, right? So being able to use it, on, and, and, and by the way, they can also grow on all the byproducts, right? So the fact that they can grow, the qualitative trait is really irrelevant, right, for, for our purposes, because they can all grow on everything, right? But the question is, are there quantitative differences in how well they can do it? And the answer is a very resounding yes, right? Uh, in Telebacteriasia, which are plotted here, we measure the growth rate for all of this, has um, a 60% growth advantage over pseudomonas. And this is huge, right? Because this is exponential growth, right? So this, this differences propagate massively. A 60% different uh, fitness difference is enormous. So very clearly, pseudomonas cannot compete uh, with the Enterobacteriaceae for, for the glucose, right? Uh, the second thing we ask is, okay, um, what are the byproducts that all these Enterobacteriaceae are producing? And, and can we measure them quantitatively? And what we found was that uh, all of the Enterobacteriaceae uh, produced very similar amounts. So, so each one of these dots is at one of our, uh, hand, well, it was not a hundred, I think 70 something uh, Enterobacteriaceae, not 50 something Enterobacteriaceae isolates. And for each one of those isolates, we measure the amount of acid they produce uh, per glucose molecule uptaken, the amount of lactate they produce, and the amount of succinate they produce. And uh, we find that actually there's, uh, well, acetate is the dominant byproduct for all of them. Uh, and not only that, but actually the differences between, uh, between these numbers are, are relatively small, right? Uh, there isn't a lot of variation in this, right? So it, it, this does tell us that members of the same uh, evolutionary group, the family level, are behaving in quantitatively rather similar ways, right? Um, and, and then the second part of our hypothesis was, is it, is it that the pseudomonas is a better, competi better competitor in the byproducts that are released by the enterobacteriaceae, right? And we met, so to that, to see if that's true, we, we measure the growth rates for the pseudomonas in acetate, succinate, and lactate, which are the, the three dominant byproducts released by the enterobacteriaceae. And we find that for all three of them, on average, pseudomonas grows stronger uh, and has a growth advantage in those secreted byproducts. So that leads to our hypothesis, which is that um, what consistent with what we saw in, the, in, in, our, in our models, uh, what may be happening here is that the glucose is primarily being uptaken by the glucose specialists who said Enterobacteriaceae, right? Uh, which form a, a guild of uh, similar um, bacteria that, that carry out the similar function of the, in this ecosystem, which is the, being the primary consumers of the glucose. And because all of these interbacteriaceae are related to one another and they have similar metabolic networks, they all employ similar metabolic strategies and release similar amounts of the same byproducts that then are, are primarily uptaken by the second metabolic guild here, the organic acid specialist, which we call R. By the way, we're gonna call F. And so to avoid throwing out names, uh, all of the bacteria that, that are part of this, uh, carry out this function, I'm gonna call F and all the bacteria that are doing the second function, which is consuming the secondary byproducts, I'm gonna call R, right? Um, th there's some reasons for that, but I don't think it, th that they matter for the purpose of this talk. So um, if our, our hypothesis is this, right? Is that the, the, the F specialists, which are the entire bacteria, take the glucose, secrete this, this goes to this, and the organic acids, which are released, go to the pseudomonas. So our hypothesis is that if, if, if our hypothesis is correct, then we should expect that over a 48 hour period of time, early on during the growth period, uh, when glucose is the only carbon source available, uh, you should see the, the F bacteria, the glucose specialist shooting up in abundance uh, and, and, and that kind of increase much more than the R guys, right? So therefore, if you take the ratio between the R bacteria and the F bacteria, it should come down, right? Because our bacteria are at a disadvantage in a glucose environment. Now, as glucose is being up, uh, uptaken, uh, organic acids are being produced, right? So our, at some point in the incubation period, glucose is gonna be exhausted and the only source of carbon are gonna be organic acids. And at that point, then we expect our bacteria to have the edge. And as they have the edge, they're supposed to go up in, in relative abundance to F, right? So the RF ratio should have this U shape um, in, in, in our communities. 
So to test this hypothesis, we thought some of the communities that we had stored in our freezer. Um, and uh, after we thought them, we measured the glucose and acetate uh, uh, over a period of 48 hours. We measured the amount of glucose and acetate as a function of time, as well as the RF ratio of different time points. And we did see, we did it for, I think it was 19 different communities. And we generally found, and I think it was over 80% of them, that this U shape is, is observed. So this again is consistent with our hypothesis that the glucose is primarily being uptaken by, by F specialists and organic acids are being uptaken by the R specialists uh, in this second part of the, of the period when, uh, of the incubation when acetate is the only carbon source, it varies with a deep increase, uh, stark increase in the, in the RF ratio um, as, as we had expected. So what we have is now, we, we, we this is a good, I think, qualitative explanation of what might be happening, but that left us with, uh, I wanted to go a bit deeper than that, right? We have a number here. We, we see that there's a quantitative pattern in our communities. We have that the ratio of pseudomonas to enterobacteria, or the RF ratio, in, in the, on average is around 0.3, right? And we wanted to try to see what could explain this particular ratio. So, um, the, kind of the most natural hypothesis, given everything I've told you, is that it might be reflecting simply the biomass that flows into each, met, each one of these two groups uh, per glucose molecule, right? So per glucose molecule entering this, um, so we have this kind of um, trophic chain here, right? Where glucose uh, gets uptaken by the F bacteria producing biomass as well as acetate, and this acetate is, is uptaken by the R bacteria producing biomass and CO2. Now, our hypothesis is very simple. Maybe per glucose molecule entered in this chain, the RF ratio should be equal to the amount, the, fra the fraction of that that goes to R the relative to the amount that goes to F, right? Uh, so that's it. That's, 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 uh, it's a very, very simple model, uh, but it's consistent with everything I've told you, right? So we wanted to see if this model would hold. And the nice thing is that we could actually measure all of these three parameters. Um, uh, first of all, the the per glucose molecule, the number of acetate molecules that are released, this D parameter here, and the amount of biomass of F cells that is uptaken per glucose molecule, uh, we can also measure that. And then we can also measure the amount of biomass of R specialists uh, that can be uh, produced per molecule of acetate, right? So um, the RF ratio is simply the product of this and this divided by that, right? So, all those three parameters are things that we can measure empirically uh, by simply growing our isolates and quantifying how much acetate they release, how much growth they have on acetate, how much growth they have on glucose, and divided by the amount of those molecules we have. And quite strikingly here for what we can see is that this also, they're also very conserved, right? Uh, this we had seen before, like all of the, the amount of acetate produced per, per glucose molecule in the interbacteries are very conserved. But what is I think very interesting is that also these efficiencies uh, in uh, the, the glucose efficiency in the enterobacteria and the acetate efficiency in the pseudomonal asia are actually quite close uh, for all of the members of those two, um, those two groups. And being able to measure all of these parameters, uh, we, did it, we calculated the RF ratio for every possible pair of R and F in our, in our collection. Um, and when we compare that with the, the ratio between uh, the R and F specialists in our communities, the, the outcome is quite surprisingly very close, right? I wouldn't even expect this simple model to be this good because there's other things here too, right? We have, um, I'm, I'm focusing on acetate, but there's other, uh, which is the primary organic acid that is being released. But we know also that there's other organic acids like lactate and succinate and so on that are being released by the, by the F specialists. Um, yet like a very first order model is actually has a lot of explanatory power over uh, what we're seeing in our communities and, and can recapitulate the RF ratio that we are measuring, um, they are, we are finding in our communities, at least the, the average. There's of course a lot of variation there, uh, which you know I, it, it should not be that surprising considering the fact that the model is really ignoring a lot of uh, what's going on too, right? Hey, Al, we should probably wrap up in the next five minutes. Yeah, okay. So um, so then th that's, the, um, that's what family convergence means. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's pr primarily reflecting a quantitative convergence of different metabolic groups. And um, the, the final part that I wanted to, um, to, to just show you for, for peace of mind is um, that one might think that what we're seeing in our, in our communities 
is, is a bit of an art, artifactual, right? Because we are creating a very uh, artificial uh, environment that none of the soil and, and plant microorganisms that we're putting in has ever seen in their evolutionary history, right? Um, so, so it might be that if uh, the, the only reason why we see it is because it's a, it's a very foreign environment that none of the bacteria we're putting in is well adapted to. So we wanted to test that, see if we let our experiments run for a longer period of time uh, with more transfers, uh, would we see, allowing species to adapt to it, would we see that that would change these ratios that we have been measuring? So we just did the same experiment that I described before. We stabilized that community for, uh, for, for nine transfers, and then we passaged it um, for 826 generations. It's close to a year of transfers every, um, every other day. Um, over that period of time, uh, the, we found that the species in our communities, uh, we, have, we isolated them and characterized them phenotypically, and we found that, that they have uh, acquired mutations and adapted to the, to the environment uh, quite dramatically, right? We, we see changes of close to 50% in, in lag phase and, and growth rate uh, on the species that we find in these habitats, right? So we are doing this experiment over a time scale where species are adapting to the habitat we're giving them. Yet despite that, we find that this ratio between these two metabolic gills is also very convergent and, and there's fluctuations about it, but, uh, but it's, it's not really changing as a function of time. Uh, here we're plotting for 12 populations uh, propagated in parallel, right? And um, we're plotting again the ratio between both metabolic gills. And you can see that they are actually quite um, fluctuating around the value they had at the beginning. And after 100 generations, they're back to a value that's very close to what they had at first. Um, population dynamics themselves, right? The, the abundance of different taxa are also very, um, very remarkably parallel. After a year of continuous passaging, I'm showing here only six, but the other six are very similar, um, which uh, six populations that have been passed for about 800 generations. Each one of these um, rows is a replicate. Here on X, you have the number of the passage of time, the number of generations, and each one of these columns represents a different replicate, right? you see that even the fluctuations that you observe as a function of time are highly correlated between all populations, um, which at least indicates that um, the, the findings that we're making are, are uh, explains that the fact, despite of evolution, the community assembly can be strongly pred predictable at, um, at the family level. Um, I, I'm not gonna have time to speak about this. Uh, we've done a bunch of experiments to try to understand what is the, um, the, the reason why we see so much uh, variation and lack of reproducibility at the species level um, have rather strong evidence that, that this is primarily caused by uh, multi-stability and alternative stable states um, and uh, with, through a combination of dynamical systems uh, theory and, uh, and ex quantitative experiments. Um, so uh, wrapping up the, the, the one, you know, I can just have a couple of, uh, of main messages here. But is that I think that this, this approach of, of bringing natural communities to the lab, which microbiologists call them enrichment communities, um, can really help us understand um, the, the limits of microbial community uh, variation, right? That exist that are intrinsic to, um, to it. And, and, and it's also a model that, a model organism, not normal organism, but a model system that makes it very, um, amenable to be comparing models and, and experiments. And through that dialogue, I think we can build a predictive theory of a microbial uh, community assembly that can help us uh, be more quantitative and, and gain a, a, a deeper understanding of, of how these, all these stochastic and deterministic processes shape um, the assembly of microbial communities. And um, all of this work has been done by the, the amazing folks in my lab. Um, and uh, they've all been such a joy to, to work with over the past five years. Uh, I, I can't express how much I've enjoyed uh, working with them. It's been, it's been an, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, all right, so I know Hernan told me that I need to, to stop. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish here and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. All right. Thanks, Al, that was great. So let's see, there's uh, at least two people, you know, it's a question, so Edward, do you want to go? 
Uh, sure. Um, uh, in in those uh, a graph halfway through, you you um, showed that the RF ratio went went down down and then back up again. Yep. Or maybe it was the other way around. But but um, I understand why it went down. I was just confused about why it went back up again. I yeah. think it's I think it's the the slide before this one. A little better slide. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So what 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 why when the organic acids come does the does the sure. um, does the R code go back up again? Right, it's because the 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 F specialists are glucose specialists, so they only have an edge uh, when glucose early on when glucose is the only carbon source. But around once the glucose is runs out, the only um, source of carbon in the environment are organic acids, and we have found that the these guys have a, a stronger growth on those than these guys, right? So. Um, the R of ratio is the ratio of this to that, right? So when uh, in conditions when um, these are growing stronger, right, um, the, it should go up, right? And it's because the, yeah. there's only as it's here, so yeah, yeah, really not taken by them, yeah. But then no, that that's obvious. The thing that's not the thing that's problematic to me is what's happening to the left of that when the R goes back up again. I don't see why so the, the R again. should go back up again. Is that because the organic acids are depleted. Right. So, so the organic acids are depleted, right? Uh, and as the organic acids get depleted, R goes up, right? Oh, because the ratio of organic acids to glucose changes. Oh, I see. Right. Got it. Right. <laughs> you yeah, think yeah, I would have yeah. gotten that? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Gren. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. So my question is about. Yeah, like I think you showed for 12 different populations over 800 generations, that slide where the, yeah. Yeah, there's one. Um, um, one before I think, yeah. The, the, um, the fluctuations seem really correlated in time to me, especially that spike around 640. Is there I, I, I know, but, but the, what's, what's fascinating is that the traits are also correlated. So what happens like at that time? Because each generation is 48 hours, you said? Or... Right, right, right. No, what, what I mean is that when we took isolates, right, and we measure the growth rates, uh, I don't think I have, did I show it? You see it? Maybe, maybe I did uh, around this time. So you, this is about 448, right? Which is, uh, it, it's a dip, but, but I don't have the data here. But you, you see that actually the, 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 Traits that allow bacteria to grow, the quantitative rates of growth and the lag phases and all those things uh, are, are also correlated, right? So uh, uh, if you look at populations at the same time, the isolates we got from those populations uh, fluctuate up and down over time on the, on the growth rates and, uh, and, and the lag phases, not only on glucose, but also on the other organic acids as well. Uh, is on the time scale of months and years then? It's, it's months, it's months. Yeah, so, but what, what I think this is telling us is that evolution is, is very, I mean, eco-evolution dynamics are very highly reproducible in this case. But over evidently very long time scales. I know. No, I, it, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It, it's, no, I, I, I was, we were shocked, like, like genuinely shocked. Um, I, you can see some of it here. I wish I had, I should have Maria. She's going to be in California soon. And hopefully you should, you should invite her to give a talk. Um, uh, you, you can see some of this here, although I didn't think that picked the best data um, of how, you know, this, this is co how convergent this is. Um, but, but it does, right? You see this the, uh, for different tactics, the growth rate in glucose and this Kle Klebsiella, it goes down and goes back up, right? Um, and uh, we, now she's done it for dozens of taxa and the result is significant statistically. Uh, and she's also taking other time points. So we can see how this, the, these fluctuations correlate and covary with um, in, in, in a, the abundances of the, of the two gills, covary with the rates uh, of growth and in, in the carbon sources that, that are in the environment. And, and they're explained by it. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. I know. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. I guess I'm trying to figure out how easy is it now for you to design uh, a certain population? 
a certain you know distribution of species if you wanted to given all the all the knowledge you have about the parameters right so uh, for species I, I don't think i can right and, and, and i think one okay. of the one of the lessons that that we are extracting is it's, it's really very difficult to to mm -hmm. to do this right um for i mean it's very difficult to design an environment and and at least you know just you manipulating the the, the, the amount of glucose you put in right whatever I mean, you could add more selective medium but but it's very hard to make a medium that will produce a specific community with that is reproducible at the level of species but it's it's quite easy to do at the level of families in fact we have done it now mm -hmm. for other carbon sources that are not glucose for other sugars um, and um, and for other organic acids and we find that basically the same RF ratio that you find in glucose is found for all sugars right so uh, we've tried hexoses like say galactose and we've tried pentoses like ribose we've tried um, disaccharides we've tried sugar alcohols like glycerol and pretty much you get for all of those um, the same RF ratio yeah. it's around 0.3 right I mean uh, for 48 hours I mean again I'm, I'm not I don't want to overgeneralize right this is true if you keep our cultures 48 hours right um, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and at 30 degrees and you know uh, yeah. So probably if you change that, things would change. Maria, for instance, now is also trying to understand how temperature would affect things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, at least under the conditions of our experiments, if you use any sugar, I can tell you what the average ratio is going to be. And not only that, but but we're now trying to do um, another one of my students, John. He's um, been trying to um, build up using machine learning and and experiments where he's been growing bacteria in different nutrient habitats to build models that are predictive of what kind of at least that for the error of ratio, they work quite well. Um, it's just what is the the the, the abundance of different um, uh, of the error of ratio in different uh, in novel nutrient environments, and, and that there there is a, a decent predictive capability. And uh, we, we've also done experiments in in vitro with um, with gut communities. So Sylvie did it with Casey Huang in Stanford, and and there the predictability at the family level is is really really strong. Right, so you could, I, I, you could, you could tell what exactly is going. I mean, I think the models predict about eighty percent of the variance at that point uh, in in um, total biomass and in the, the abundance of enterobacteria can be predicted extremely well. Um, so I, I think that at this at more coarse grain levels of organization, in under the conditions of our experiments, again, right? So we we don't have any variation that is not controlled for and so on. Uh, but it is possible to be predictive of this family level structure and um, and the, the metabolic structure of our communities. Uh, but I don't think we can predict at the species level. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Robin? This is a really cool talk. I'm glad I was able to come. Thank you. This is a, a fairly simple selective environment. You want to yeah. work really fast on the sugar that is available or do well on the main byproduct of that sugar. Yeah. And it, it works at the family level because you do have that trait conservatism. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what happens when you have a more complicated selective environment. Maybe there are, maybe there are two sugars. So you've got yeah. two resources and now, you know, is, we, we, we just, Is there yeah. enough similarity across the family to be to predict or, or no? Right. We just uh, um, we have a paper coming in the next week or uh, that we did exactly that. Um, Should we any life in the next uh, uh, few days? Um, and we found some stuff that we're still trying to process. Um, we find actually two sugars you get the same because I mean it, like if you have sugar one and sugar two, the community is almost identical anyway. So um, at the family level, right? So putting the two together doesn't doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. um, we found actually that when you mixed a sugar and an organic acid at the start, um, depending on the family, right? Uh, but there are uh, relationships of dominance where the effect of the sugar will mask the organic acid. Interestingly, it doesn't that doesn't happen for pseudomonas, right? So pseudomonas, um, if you grow pseudomonas in, say, citrate and grow it on glucose, and then you grow it in citrate plus glucose, the abundance it reaches in the community is the same. It's basically the, the average of both, right? Uh, but for other families, um, 
like Monaxalasia, Rhizobiaceae, and other respirator families. Um, when you mix two different, uh, two different, uh, a sugar and an organic acid, the, they will not be present in the sugar. They will reach very high abundance in the, amino, in the, in the organic acid, but when you mix the two, uh, they're not present in the community, right? So uh, the, the sugar kind of, even though they could grow in, in the organic acid alone, when the sugar is there, they don't. Or they, they are, at least they are outcompeted by the, by the interbacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we found actually that, that consumer resource models uh, show dominance under, under the conditions of our experiments. So it is, it is very, uh, it's a very possible outcome that when you have multiple resources, if the advantage that the specialist in one uh, overpowers the advantage of the specialist in the other, right? Uh, that you might have that the, the one that is the specialist in the more uh, in, in the less valuable resource will not make it in the community as long as there's enough overlap and both are have can some degree of gener generalism right because in in all of these experiments that i've told you about i want to be very clear that the it, this is only an approximation right like uh, this stuff over there rf ratio we know for sure that that the, the gluc glucose is also uptaken by the pseudomonas right so um they do grow a little bit right on, on glucose and the interactive that grow a little bit too when, when the organic acids are, are the only carbon source, right? So the, the, the specialization is not perfect. Um, it's, uh, there, there is some, some growth on, on, on the, 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 the research that the other one is the specialist on. Uh, and that actually is important to stabilize competition in our communities. So uh, what we think is happening when you're mixing two resources is that uh, the advantage that this one gains in glucose, if it is strong enough, it might actually um, over, it might overpower the, this, this guy if the advantage that it gains in acetate is not enough uh, to compensate for, for this, right? It, it works out for pseudomonas because pseudomonas is actually much better than, than, than this, than enterobacteriaceae on the organic acids. But if it were not as good as it is, it would not work out, right? So it, depend, it really depends on the quantitative uh, ratios of uptake rates in the model, and experimentally it works out too. So the, when you build up more complex environments, you can get um, very interesting uh, non 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 trivial effects. I would say uh, on how they combine to uh, generate uh, community composition. But, but you know, if you're if you're curious, that, that we'll have a paper out. It should I mean it's should come out this week, uh, and we we discuss that particular point. All right. Well, I think we should let Al go. It's getting late though, over there on the East Coast. So <laughs> thank you so much, Al. And I'm sure if there are any other questions, I'm sure you can email him and he'll be happy to, to continue the discussion over there. Um, Absolutely. Thanks again. And yeah, congrats. And yeah, so <laughs> have a good night and bye everybody. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, bye Al.